Chapter 19 Heart Attack Throughout the whole of my technical career at Guy's, staining pieces of tissue for histological analysis was a routine task for me. Once I had cut the piece of tissue to a certain size, I would mount it in a thin block of wax, which would then be sliced on a microtome in order to produce a fine sliver. Once I had subjected this sliver, officially known as a section, to the relevant staining technique, any pathology present would show up according to the range of dyes used to determine it. In forensic medicine, there was always the holy grail of finding a staining technique to improve the chances of finding early myocardial infarction, otherwise known as a heart attack. Early myocardial infarction wasn't always readily detectable to the naked eye, as very little sign of its presence was exhibited in the heart itself. During a heart attack, the blood vessels will become blocked, though the heart continues to pump, and its muscle fibres continue to work. Eventually, however, all the available oxygen in the individual heart cells will have been spent and, as a result, they will die. The problem for the pathologist is that, during their post-mortem examination, the changes in the cells are not always visible to the naked eye. In some cases, the heart tissue may appear slightly bruised, but sometimes, if the heart has stopped beating rapidly, for instance, this lessens the possibility of unequivocally giving heart attack as a cause of death. Even as a histologist, if a routine staining technique is used, these changes to the heart might not even be evident under the microscope. My research in this area began with a free sample of a new dye, rhodonyl blue sulphate, which was sent to me by a scientific stockist. When I read up on it, I learned that it acted on tissue in a state of reduction, i.e. deterioration, or, in layman's terms, tissue in which oxygen is being depleted. I hit on the idea of trialling its use when staining a piece of heart tissue in a case of suspected heart attack. What I actually noticed was that it highlighted, in a different colour from the healthy surrounding tissue, individual muscle fibres affected by the lack of oxygen. These turned a much darker purplish-blue than the more oxygenated, healthy heart tissue. My new technique worked so well that it caught the attention of Dr Dick Richard Shepherd, one of the pathologists with whom I worked at Guy's. He is now very well known for his television series, Autopsy, The Last Hours Of... He became a very active supporter of my research and began to collect samples of tissue specifically for me to experiment on. We also worked together on clarifying the results and eventually wrote a paper on the stain and my scientific findings, which Dick asked me to present with him that year, 1991, at the American Society of Forensic Sciences in New Orleans. My research was, overall, so well received that many of the pathologists present requested a handout to pass on to their own technicians. However, one British pathologist wasn't so enthusiastic and expressed surprise that I was able to present a paper as I was only a biomedical scientist, not a doctor. This, of course, flew in the face of the decades of knowledge and scientific expertise involved in creating such a valuable asset to the pathology community. Prior to my research, and my subsequent presentation at the conference, I had never acquired more than a basic scientific qualification, my full technical certificate, FTC. Now, seeing the rather short-sighted reception with which I was met by this detractor, Dick put to me the suggestion that I would have more clout if I were to gain a higher qualification. His own wife, Jen, had just gained an open university degree, which had taken her from nursing to work as a general practitioner and this was the direction in which he pointed me. He knew only too well how much credibility a scientific degree would confer, and how much more validation it would give to my findings as a scientist. Thanks to Dick's advice, I flew home with a new agenda. Only a few months later, I was sitting on my usual commuter train into London Bridge with huge study books from the Open University on my lap. This was the start of a six-year study period, aimed at obtaining a Bachelor of Science with Honours degree. Train journeys had previously offered me an opportunity for sleep after starting out at the crack of dawn. This was now abandoned, as I studied instead during my 90-minute commute into London each day. I would study again on the journey home after a full day's work. It wasn't easy when I was tired, 
but I had fully committed myself to the weekly fifteen-hour study time frame required, and knew I had to reshape the course of my working day, including my lunch breaks. A less welcome element of this was missing out on many of our boozy departmental lunches. However, I was keen to adhere to my set agenda in order to keep up, and not lose any valuable study time, and not let it encroach on my home life, if possible. After the requisite six years, I gained my degree, and it changed my life almost immediately. Through the work I had conducted, I had by now become a recognised injury pattern expert, and the Royal Photographic Society honoured this by conferring the title of Graduate Imaging Scientist on me, quickly followed by another honour, Associate of the Royal Photographic Society. Dr Ian West had helped here, by giving the Society a glowing review of my achievements, including all the contributions I had made to the Forensic Department at Guy's over my many years there, and my crucial contributions to the National Injuries Database. 